Paul Spitzeri, director of the Homestead Museum. And we are talking today about the Workman and Temple family and their connections to San Gabriel, both the mission and the city from 1842 to 1972. So a long 130 year period, lots to discuss in terms of their activities in the uh, mission city. So we'll look at uh, families in terms of their involvement at the Old Stone Church at the Mission, many sacraments, uh, baptisms and weddings, funerals, that sort of thing. Also some aspects of ownership of mission lands and how the family was involved in that in the 19th century, as well as the development of downtown areas across the Mission during the 1920s and commemoration historically by members of the family from the 1930s to the early 1970s. We go back actually to what was called Misión Vieja, or Old Mission. This is an area in the Whittier Narrows between the Manobelo and Puente Hill systems, where the original site of Mission San Gabriel was established in 1771. A lot of people don't know that the mission is actually in its second location. So at the bottom of this map, where it says Rancho La Merced, you can see just above that the, the name of Old Mission. And this is because that was the site where the mission was established in, on September 8th, 1771, when the Portola expedition came through two years before that in the summer. Father Juan Crespi was tasked, among other things, with identifying potential mission sites. And when he got to the Whittier Narrows and saw the abundance of water from what became known as the San Gabriel River coming down from the San Gabriel Mountains into that narrow uh, opening between the Puente and Montebello Hills, he could see the abundant plant and animal life the indigenous people settled there millennia before that. And so it really is a crucible of human settlement when you think about it for the greater Los Angeles area. This is an image that purports to show ruins of the mission San Gabriel. The problem is, is that there were no adobe buildings as part of that original facility. A tule or plant material was used to build structures. So this was someone's home from later on, but was talked about or presented as the ruins of the San Gabriel Mission. Our connection with Misión Vieja is mainly through the Temple family living there from the early 1850s until about 1917. The old mission area had been settled a little before that, probably in the 1830s, by families who were uh, either retired soldiers or descendants of them. So the Abitres, the Balanzuelas, other families that settled there first and then the temples came along in 1851 because William Werpen, who resided here at the homestead, had loaned money to the grantee of Rancho La Merced, which I had talked about in the previous slide. Uh, Casilda Soto de Lobo, one of the few women to own ranchos in that period, at a time when in Spanish and Mexican California, women could own real property as opposed to their counterparts in other parts of the United States. And so Casilda Soto de Lobo borrowed money from William Werpen, could not pay the loan back. He foreclosed on her in 1850 and then very quickly turned the rancho over to his son-in-law, FPF Temple, who was married to Antonia Margarita Workman, as well as to Juan Matias Sanchez. Sanchez had been the maradoma or foreman for Werpen on the Rancho La Puente, just a little bit east of, of this Misión Vieja community. Sanchez chose to live in the uh, Soto uh, de Lobo Adobe, which is on a bluff a little bit south of where the temples resided, not too far from the Whittier Narrows Dam, whereas the temples chose to live at this location shown in this photograph. So you're basically looking very close to the intersection of today's Rosemead Boulevard, where it runs into San Gabriel Boulevard, and then Durfee Avenue comes in from the east and northeast. You're looking at the uh, uh, family water tower and then to the left and in the background is the L-shaped adobe that the temple family constructed. Uh, that structure was still here into the early 20th century. You can see the fencing, the trees, the uh, area where you have stables and, and uh, what have you. So it was a pretty well-developed uh, site here for the temple family and their half of Rancho La Merced. Later, Walter P. Temple, a son of uh, FPF Temple and Antonio Margarita Workman is able to uh, have the money to put up a marker at the southwest corner of Lincoln Avenue and San Gabriel Boulevard to commemorate the founding of the San Gabriel Mission. This was done for the 150th birthday of the institution in 1921. 
Now, Walter placed a monument at this location because he happened to own that land, but the mission site was not actually there. Just behind, in this photograph on the right, just behind the marker is a steep hill. And so there was no room for anything of that type to be located at that particular spot. If you were standing looking at that marker today and turned around facing north, northeast, across San Gabriel Boulevard on the west bank of what is now the Rio Hondo, the old channel of the San Gabriel River, that is roughly where the mission was located. So people go there, they see the marker, they think the mission was at that exact site, but you would have to turn around and uh, look in another direction, very close by within probably a couple hundred, few hundred yards, whatever it is, to see where the, uh, the original mission site was roughly located. There are no indications today because there's been so much development over the years, whether it was farming in the 19th century or, or raising cattle, whatever it might've been, and then oil in the early 20th century. So much disturbance that there's no way to know the exact site of the mission today. A couple other photographs of uh, recent work done by the city of Montebello to improve the location where the marker is, including landscaping and sidewalks. So this is a real nice photo, a, a mission bell. In the background, by the way, behind the fencing is the part of the Montebello Hills where there would be oil discovered in the 1910s. And we'll get that story in a moment, but first we're gonna uh, go back to the 1840s and the arrival in Southern California of a group from New Mexico using the old Spanish trail, which happened to be neither old nor Spanish. And the party has had different names, Workman and Roland Party, the Roland Workman Expedition. There was actually a uh, Genesaro, uh, indigenous and Spanish resident of Abacu named Lorenzo Trujillo, who had been a frequent traveler on the old Spanish trail and he guided these folks across. Whatever this this group was, about 65 people roughly of uh, New Mexicans, Americans and Europeans, they took the old Spanish trail to get here in the fall of 1841. John Rowland, who was on that group along with the Werpen family, then went to Monterey, talked to Governor Juan Bautista Arado, submitted an application for a land grant to the Rancho La Puente. In this map on the left, upper left side, you can see the location of the San Gabriel Mission. Once it had moved from the Mission Vieja or old mission site, which would be towards the bottom left, you can see a curved line, which is a road uh, extending through the, the uh, image from left to right. That's uh, Valley Boulevard coming from the mission and then going through the Rancho La Puente and up into the Pomona area on the top right. Towards the lower left would be a road that went into the old mission community from the La Puente Rancho and then probably became San Gabriel Boulevard as it makes its way up towards uh, the mission, or at least would go into Los Angeles. In any case, the Roland and Werpen expedition basically got into San Gabriel Mission and then into Los Angeles late in 1841. And then Roland gets the uh, application to the, the Rancho and in doing so has a diseño or a map drawn. These typically were very rough ideas of boundaries and natural landmarks and that sort of thing. The, there were no requirements or really a need to have anything more refined than that. It just so happened there was a surveyor that came along with Roland Workman and the others in 1841. And so he did this diseño. You can see some surveyed lines at the bottom and on the right side with the northern boundary of the Rancho being the road at the top, part of which is Ramona Boulevard in the Baldwin Park area, and then San Bernardino Road into Covina, up through Charter Oak and out towards Pomona. So this is a diseño that has a little more structure to it than most because of, of the fact that a surveyor worked on it. The original land grant in 1842 was about 18,000 acres. When the grant petition was presented to the governor, there was a protest from the priests at San Gabriel who were informing government officials that they were still using part of Rancho La Puente for raising livestock and some farming, even though the missions had been secularized about eight years before. Secularization meaning basically the missions were shut down after roughly 65 years of operation. So the land that the mission controlled from its current site in San Gabriel out to San Bernardino included a number of ranchos, uh, San Jose, now Pomona, Cucamonga, as well as La Puente and others were no longer officially or legally theirs to use. In other words, the priests didn't have the legal right to, to occupy or make use of these lands. They still protested, but to no avail. And Roland got his land grant in April, 1842. Three years later, when Pio Pico was the governor of Alta California, the Department of Mexico, as it was known in those days, Pico issued a new grant 
based on Roland's petition. One of the strange things about that was that the 1842 original grant was only made to Roland, but the regrant three years later included William Murpin as a co-owner, even though he'd been living there the three years. And Roland's way of explaining why Werpen was to be added was a little bit strange. It almost made it sound like it was a mistake that Werpen was not included. It certainly was not a mistake. There might have been some reason that Werpen was left off the original grant, maybe because he had been accused of being involved in a plot to assassinate the governor of New Mexico prior to Werpen, Roland, and the others coming to California. In any case, that second land grant made by Governor Pio Pico, this is an early photograph of the, of the governor. And one thing that's notable about this image is that when a researcher scientist in Virginia saw this, his daughter had sent a, a picture of Pico that was on a postcard back to her father. He immediately recognized the symptoms of his own specialty. Uh, Dr. Ivan Logan noticed that Pio Pico appeared to have a condition called acromegaly, which involves a, a glandular problem that would cause a pressure from, from the growth of this uh, gland on the face, causing distortions. Uh, for example, the eyes are distended, they're not in, in alignment, and that includes the, the way the flash is resonated on the pupils. It means the loss of facial hair. It could mean the, the, uh, the, the lips, the nose, other parts of the face become uh, thicker because of the pressure of the gland on the face itself. We know that Don Pio, for example, also, who was married to Maria Ignacia Alvarado, could not have children in these years or did not have children. That is another feature of acromegaly. Yet later on, he did have children. Later on, his lips, his nose, his facial features were much different. His eyes were back in alignment. He had more facial hair, and later on, he had children. It was pointed out by Dr. Logan uh, that only 2% of people who have acromegaly survive it. Almost everybody dies from the condition. Pico was one of the lucky few who was able to overcome that disease. In any case, we're talking about the period of time when the Werpen and Temple family began to use San Gabriel Mission as a place for weddings, baptisms, funerals, and other sacraments. William Werpen and his wife, Nicolasa Urioste, were common law married in New Mexico as far back as the, the late 1820s. But they had a church marriage at San Gabriel in February 1844 in conjunction with Benjamin D. Wilson and his wife, Maria Romoni Orba. Uh, Wilson came with Werpen from New Mexico. So that's just one example of an early use of the mission for sacramental purposes by the family. And speaking of Pico, here's a, another photograph of him later on. So you can see the facial hair and the, the different representation of his features, including the eyes being back in alignment. And so it just shows the, the, what Dr. Logan talked about with the acromegaly. Pico, in becoming governor, was assisted by workmen, as well as John Rowland and other estranjeros or foreigners, in unseating the governor at that time, Manuel Michoterena. There was a, a battle at Cuenca Pass in early 1845, not much in terms of casualties, but Michel Trena retreated from the field and then returned to Mexico, leaving Governor uh, Pico to take that seat. And almost immediately, Pico began to distribute what you could call spoils of war. For example, Werpen and the governor's brother Andres Pico were given a grant to uh, San Clemente Island off the coast of San Diego and Orange Counties. Another island was granted uh, specifically to Werpen up in San Francisco Bay. It was known as Bird or Alcatraces, which we know as Alcatraz Island. And then Werpen and a Scotchman named Hugo Reed, who lived near the mission, was married to a prominent indigenous person named Victoria Bartolomea, were given a land grant to the property, the lands of the San Gabriel mission. And again, this is after the secularization. So the mission church still existed as a parish church, but the lands were granted to Werpen and Reed. When the Americans took over in Alta California at the end of the 1840s, there was a great deal of debate about what to do with the land grants of the Spanish and Mexican period. So Congress passed the Land Claims Act early in 1851 that required the owners of ranchos to present documentation and evidence of their grant to a commission. And while two thirds of those land grants were approved by the commission, the policy of Washington DC was to automatically appeal any successful decision, first at that commission and then to federal district courts, if necessary, up to the United States Supreme Court. So in the case of the San Gabriel Mission Lands Grant, Reed died just prior to the filing of the claim. So there were other people who inherited his half of the claim. 
But Werpen and those uh, heirs of Reed had their ruling overturned by the United States Supreme Court in 1864. So they were not able to retain those grants. And for that matter, San Clemente and Alcatraz Islands were also taken by the United States government as military property. So work and spoils of war didn't work out for him in the long run. So again, this whole period of time when you're dealing with these, these situations with the land grants and all of that, we're also intermixed with the family having a personal connection to the mission. So you would often find uh, William Werpen or his wife, Nicolasa, their daughter, Antonia Margarita, uh, and her children being sponsors of other families' children for baptisms, for example, or standing as witnesses for marriage ceremonies. So the ties between the family and the mission were extensive through the, the 19th century. We are, however, going to jump forward now to the early 20th century and specifically the 1910s and get to another generation in different facets of the connection of the family to San Gabriel. On the left is Walter P. Temple, his wife, Laura Gonzalez, and their four surviving of five children. Walter and Laura grew up together in very close proximity in the Mission Vieja or Old Mission community. And Laura, at the age of about 15, became an employee of Walter's brother, Francis, here at the Workman Homestead, specifically in the Workman House. Among other things, she basically ran the ranch while Francis Temple was off trying to improve his health. He had tuberculosis, and so he would go to places like Arizona to try to dry out his lungs, basically, and see if he could get relief from his malady. And so Laura stayed behind and, and took care of the place. We actually have a ledger of hers from the 1880s where she wrote down uh, the work that she oversaw while Francis was absent. At that same time, she had a secret clandestine romance with Walter, who was just a, about a year older, year or two. And it was secret because Walter's family would not have approved of his having a relationship with an employee of the family. And so there were ways that they could try to evade that, writing letters to each other. And when we do our love letters tour here in February, at the museum, you can come here, uh, one of the letters being written, or and, and then we'll read it to you, of Walter writing to Laura, telling her that he would like to meet her in the Warpen House basement. So if you come on that tour, you go in the basement, you get to hear that letter being talked about. The couple may have broken up at some point. They wound up marrying much later, uh, 15 years or so after their initial romance. They married in 1903 and then began raising their family at the Temple Homestead, which I showed an image of before with the water tower and the adobe. Walter inherited uh, that land when his mother died in the 1890s, and then after his brother left the area, became the full owner. However, he decided in 1912 to sell the homestead and move his family to another location just a few hundred yards to the west. Uh, on the same property, Rancho La Merced, in the old mission community, but land that had been owned by his father and grandfather in the 1870s prior to the failure of their Temple and Workman Bank. The bank took out a loan from Lucky Baldwin, a well-known colorful character in California. Baldwin held onto that land until his death in 1909. And within a few years, Walter Temple goes to the executor of the estate and asks if he can buy some of that property. And so a deal is arranged where about 60 acres is purchased on the Manobello Hills, the very northeast corner, and some of the flat land up to the Rio Hondo. Walter didn't have the cash to pay for it outright, so they worked out a financing deal, and he moved his family to an adobe building on that property. So the photo on the left shows the temples sitting on some of the hillside land near the house. They called this area Temple Heights. It didn't have much to it, as you can see. The land was pretty barren, so you'd have uh, scrub and, and brush and uh, chaparral. Uh, sages and that sort of thing. It didn't appear to have a lot of value to it at the time this photograph was taken. Now, the young man standing at the left is the oldest of the Temple family's four children, Thomas Workman Temple II. And in 1914, in April, he is playing up in those hills with a couple of friends, and they noticed a pool of water that was bubbling, turning black, smelled a rotten egg smell. I'm going to share some of the story in, in one of the subsequent editions of this series uh, about the Temple family and the Mission Vieja community. But the short story is, is that Thomas accidentally stumbled upon oil. The photo on the right shows a worker coming from one of the gushers on what was called the Temple Lease. Now, the Baldwin heirs, two daughters, had hundreds of acres in the Montebello Hills and lots of oil wells, and they made a great deal of money from that. Walter, uh, Laura, and, and their uh, children had 60 acres, several successful wells, and made a small fortune. 
And you can't get a better virtual and visual indication of how much change there was with the Temple family than these two photographs. On the left, you're looking at the, the Temples about 1914, standing next to the adobe house they were living in. Walter had been basically making a living for 10 or more years as a teamster, as an insurance agent, raising walnuts and apples, trying a variety of things to provide for his family. But after the oil came in, you can see in the photo on the right here, this is the, the Temple family as probably near, if not millionaires uh, of a small scale. And the boys are at military school wearing their uniforms. Uh, the daughter still has a bow in her hair, but uh, a little bit nicer clothing. That is October, 1919, roughly four or five years after the photo on the left. Meanwhile, over at San Gabriel, it remained a small hamlet village through the 19th century and into the early 20th. Not a lot of change going on uh, during those years, but you're starting to see the slow growth of suburban spread from Los Angeles into the San Gabriel Valley by the time you get to the teens. Pasadena was becoming a pretty substantial city. Alhambra was starting to grow. You have South Pasadena. So the edges of the San Gabriel Valley starting to develop in, in the first part of the 20th century. San Gabriel did incorporate in 1913, probably out of concerns about annexation attempts by other places uh, nearby. At the time that it incorporated, there were probably about 1,200 people. This image here is, I believe, Mission Drive looking to the northwest. So the mission is out of view to the left, uh, the, the rectory being next to that. On the right would be uh, where Santa Anita Drive is located, just past the Clabbird building there on the left in that first power pole, and then you just look up Mission Drive from there. If I'm correct, this is uh, an area that would change dramatically within a very short period of time. Another interesting view, because it shows what San Gabriel mostly meant to uh, locals and outsiders, which is as a remnant or a relic of a bygone time the Spanish and Mexican period. So in this case, it looks like tourists coming out to take a photo next to the ruins of what had been. The idea that the, the pre-American period, there was very little left. And so uh, you're actually looking at, at an octagonal adobe building that I believe was built by a gentleman from Scotland whose last name was spelled money, but it was pronounced Monet. Uh, maybe as an affectation. William Monet was quite a character, uh, a, an amateur scientist, wrote a lot of interesting things about the universe and uh, sundry subjects during his time out in San Gabriel. But this is more what you would see uh, people's interest in. When you get to the uh, arrival of the Transcontinental Railroad in the 1880s, coming just after Helen Hunt Jackson's famous novel, Ramona, there is a definite interest in what has often become known as Spanish fantasy heritage, where you really can't make much of a distinction between what was historical and what was mythical. Uh, another example of how this would be played out would be the tourists coming to see the mission on the streetcar, a bit of which you can see at the bottom left. Henry E. Huntington brings the streetcar out to San Gabriel in the early years of the 20th century as part of what became known as the Pacific Electric Railway System. And that meant more visitation. It definitely helped the, the local economy. But in terms of understanding what was history and what was myth, that was another question entirely. By the way, that belfry on the top right there, you can see a couple of the bells missing. Lucky Baldwin had one of those, uh, did return it later on. He had some story apparently where he uh, claimed there was an accidental uh, mistake that brought one of the bells over to his Rancho Santa Anita, where Arcadia is today. But here's a, a few pertinent examples from our collection of how the, the myth or the misunderstanding of history is perpetrated in the tourism industry at San Gabriel. These are all snapshots of visitors coming out to the museum, uh, the mission, pardon me, which did have a museum of, of sorts, but uh, to, to visit. And so the gentleman on the left there is wearing a sombrero and uh, playing as a Mexican, if you will. Whereas the other two gentlemen are putting on a feathered headdress, which is more reminiscent of the Plains part of the United States, certainly not here in greater Los Angeles. So playing dress up as a way to engage in history is not a, a very substantial way of doing it, kind of a shallow way for sure, but uh, very common and very typical of that time. And there were other ways in which this was manifested. One is through the, the Ramona myth itself. So the, the novel Ramona was about a fictional character, but it was so popular that people came out and, and insisted 
that uh, as they saw places that identified themselves as being Ramona's home, that she must have been real. This could have been at uh, the the Camulos Ranch in Ventura County, where Helen Hunt Jackson wrote a lot of the book while staying with the De La Valle family. It could be the, the Ramona uh, pageant out in Hemet and the understanding that Ramona was an indigenous person or part indigenous person uh, from that part, uh, the Cahuilla Indians, for example, of that region. San Gabriel, though, also had its Ramona home. It's actually reflected at the bottom right. Someone uh, you know, put the lettering on there that Ramona lived here in San Gabriel. So like George Washington slept here, in many places we have our version with Ramona. Uh, you have the, the Mission Playhouse uh, in the background. You can see the bell tower behind the steeply roofed building there. So it's also the location of where the Mission Play wound up being performed. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. Walter Temple started with his oil money to get involved in real estate development, as well as his own oil projects. And this happens very quickly after the first oil revenues are brought in during the summer of 1917. He begins in Alhambra, where he had moved his family, but he starts to look at nearby locations, including El Monte, La Puente, or Puente as it was known in those days, and Ramona Acres, which became Monterey Park. And then he also identifies San Gabriel as a place of interest. And again, he had a, a connection to it from a personal level as well as a business one. So a couple of short references in newspapers to his building a one-story store structure across the mission, getting a permit for a post office, all part of what became known as the Temple Block, which you can see an image of there on the top left from a 1920s San Gabriel Chamber of Commerce publication. So that one story block of stores I just mentioned was what also called the arcade building because you can see the arches and then a covered walkway or arcade as part of that. This is at the eastern end of the temple block. The two story structure of the temple building is in the center. And then there would be the post office, which I referred to just briefly a moment ago at the western end. The bottom photograph is a real photo postcard from the 20s of that arcade building where there were a series of shops that Walter Temple constructed. As for that post office on the bottom left is a architectural rendering by Walker and Eisen, a very prominent Los Angeles architectural firm that mostly did commercial structures, including quite a few for Walter P. Temple. And that's their rendering of the post office. Thomas Temple, the oil discoverer and eldest child in the family is posed in a charro suit next to a window at the uh, end of the post office. You can see it by the, the main entrance there on the left of the drawing. Uh, Thomas was almost certainly dressed up for one of the fiestas held at the mission every September, and that became almost part of his persona later on, as we'll talk about. At the very far uh, western end, uh, pardon me, eastern end of the uh, temple block was a lot that Walter set aside for the building of a new city hall. So citizens in San Gabriel had to vote for a $50,000 bond for the construction. Again, a Walker and Eisen design. The photograph is uh, more recent. And the city hall is basically tied into the arcade building, a little bit of which can be seen at the far right of the photograph. City hall was uh, completed in uh, 1924. And uh, that was, again, a gift of the land to the city from Walter Temple. A great little uh, pamphlet from probably the mid 20s of San Gabriel, very typical of, of its kind and time. The Chamber of Commerce obviously is there to sell. Uh, the city as best as it can. So it has the inevitable references to San Gabriel being in the center of San Gabriel Valley, uh, being uh, a place with the great climate and the fertile soil, but it also had the history to promote too. So it likes to talk about here uh, being the home of the mission play, which was what San Gabriel was really known for, for most people from the early 1910s until the depression years. The population did, as was the case throughout greater Los Angeles, grow dramatically in San Gabriel from about 1,200 in 1910 to uh, close to 3,000 by 1920. And then during the Roaring Twenties, another uh, growth up to about 7,000, pretty pretty significant for uh, that time. And it's reflected in the publication where you can see images of new stores, uh, houses, institutions, all of those uh, elements that uh, make a community. And so uh, really great to have this in our collection, reflecting the changes going on in San Gabriel, as you would find in other towns in that period, including the pretty uh, new advent of aerial photography utilized during that time. For several years, Walter Temple had his real estate and oil company headquarters 
in San Gabriel at that two-story building I pointed out earlier. So here's some letterhead for what was dubbed the Temple Estate Company. That firm managed all of Walter Temple's real estate investments except for the town of Temple, renamed Temple City, and which is having its centennial celebration, by the way, on the 30th in a couple of weeks. And what Walter Temple did is he had the Temple Townsite Company separate from um, the estate business. He was the president, his uh, longtime friend and business manager, Milton Kaufman, was secretary of both. Kaufman really had a, a very strong hand in selecting the projects that were developed under the Temple Estate Company. Kaufman had been raised in Omani. He and his father owned a store. He was pretty involved in the development of Baldwin Park in its early years and had some ties to oil as well. So he and Temple uh, partnered to get involved in so many projects, both on the oil and real estate sides uh, during the, the uh, 1920s period. The letter, by the way, was written by Kaufman to Temple, who was on board a steamship at Havana, Cuba, because uh, Walter uh, was taking his three sons back to Massachusetts to enroll them in schools. And it was a family vacation during the summer of 1926. Other aspects of involvement that Temple had during this period of time on the left is a photograph from a collection of the San Gabriel Settlement House. These were institutions set up to work with immigrants to become Americanized. So this meant language classes, courses in how to run a household properly, raise your children, cook and clean. It was uh, something we would not do the same way today, but the intention was to help immigrants get settled here in terms of the ideas of Americanization as held at that time. On the, the bottom is a photograph of the San Gabriel Country Club, of which Temple was a member. He was also an officer and director of, of a bank in San Gabriel during this time as well. Now, one of the things that was uh, very important about the Temple family dynamic was that Laura Gonzalez showing business acumen as a teenager, as I pointed out before, when she was helping to run the ranch here in the 1880s at the homestead. Uh, maintained that. Her uh, middle son, standing at the, at the right next to his mother, Walter P. Temple Jr., told me many years ago, uh, with tears in his eyes, that if his mother had not passed away at the end of 1922, that things would have been very different because she had a way of, of handling uh, business affairs and, and maybe being a rein on and a check on her husband and his enthusiasm for things, because Walter certainly was excited during a boom period to get involved in as many development activities in oil and real estate as possible. And so his namesake son indicated to me that the loss of his mother changed the family dynamic, not just personally, which would be obvious, but also in the business side of things. When uh, Laura Gonzalez Temple died, they had her funeral at the San Gabriel Mission Church at the end of December 1922. Also during this period, I made reference before to the creation of that dedication plaque or marker to the original site of the San Gabriel Mission. Uh, on the top right is an advertisement from a Los Angeles newspaper for the 150th anniversary of the mission held on the last two days of July 1921, including the dedication of a monument to Junipero Serra, founder of most of the California missions. He is a, a figure of great controversy today, especially among those who are indigenous and uh, have sympathies with the plight of the indigenous people during the mission period. And so the, the advertisement refers to that, that Bishop Cantwell of the Catholic Church came out to bless that, uh, that statue of Serra. But there's also the dedication of the marker for the San Gabriel Mission. It says that it was present, presented to the town of Temple by Walter P. Temple. Uh, during that time. Also, a historical pageant directed by Lillian Burkhart Goldsmith, uh, who happened to be a, a Jewish uh, playwright, did a lot of interesting things with uh, theater work and pageants like this during the first part of the 20th century. A barbecue, a carnival, street dance, and of course, a night in old Madrid, uh, referring to the, the Spanish side of things. That was the popular code word of the time was Spanish. Uh, people loved to refer to themselves or felt they had to do so as Spanish rather than Mexican because it had a European connotation to it, a, a different level of status, if you will. The photo on the left is of Thomas and Agnes Temple siblings. They were characters in that historical pageant that Lillian Goldsmith wrote, uh, but that allowed them to dress in costume and uh, put themselves in a very personal context because they had ancestry dating back to early California from the, the Spanish and Mexican periods. The photo on the right is uh, Agnes, a second to the right, standing with a large hat, out of costume, uh, 
with others who participated in the pageant. These were all young women, descendants of early families, uh, the Lugos, the Yorbas, for example, uh, during that uh, pageant celebration for the 150th anniversary. I referred earlier to the mission play, and there was no symbol that was more important to San Gabriel from 1912 to about 1932 than this long running performance. Uh, they said 2 million people saw this over the course of 20 years. John Stephen McGrordy was the author of the mission play. He was influenced by the Oberammergau, a passion play from Germany. And this was a celebration of the Franciscan missionaries and their labors with the native peoples during the, the Spanish period, especially, and into the Mexican era of California. The story of the indigenous people was not brought out in uh, a way that we would do now. And uh, so the play is certainly outdated. There was a restaging several years ago at San Gabriel that tried to, to provide more balance in the, the perspectives and the presentation of that story. The temples were avid supporters of this. Uh, Walter Temple especially was, was uh, a, a, a great fan of the mission play. They had family connections as well because Laura Gonzalez Temple's niece was with her husband the principal dancers and choreographers of the mission play. So here's John Stephen McGordy, uh, the author of it. He became later the poet laureate of California, was also a member of Congress, wrote a lot of articles as well as books. Uh, Los Angeles from the mountains to the sea, early 1920s was at one time a, a widely read history that he put together. I mentioned the uh, niece of uh, Laura Temple. She is uh, pictured here in the center with other dancers from the mission play. They're posed next to the stone church at San Gabriel. You can see the steps that lead to the choir loft there uh, off to the right. And we had a donation recently uh, from a family member of the Vigare family. Uh, they were the uh, Juanita Vigare and her husband uh, Juan Zorokinos were the, as I said, the principal dancers and choreographers and uh, their niece uh, donated some fantastic photographs uh, and documents related to the mission play, including this one, Pasha Power played a principal character, Senora Yorba, and uh, she and her husband were uh, theater actors. And so Pasha Power was within the play for a few years. Her daughter with the large bow uh, is seated next to her, as is her son, Tyrone, who appeared briefly in the play in the early 20s. Uh, Tyrone became the famous uh, film star later on, Blood and Sand and other classic Hollywood films. Another major actor and actually playing uh, Senor Yorba before Pasha Power was Lucretia Del Valle. I, I mentioned the Del Valle family earlier. They were the owners of the Comodos Rancho where Helen Hunt Jackson wrote a substantial part of her Ramona novel. Lucretia was a, a very well-regarded uh, theater actor during this period, not just in the mission play, but, but other performances in Los Angeles. She went out to Broadway in New York briefly, uh, then married and raised a family and left the theater profession but a uh, prominent actor as well as a descendant of early California families here. The portrayal of Native Americans, as I said before, in the mission play was uh, a relic of its time, not how we would do things today. McGrordy, I think, felt that he was being accurate in terms of the representation. So you can see here are some of the actors from the mission play posing in front of the playhouse. Uh, one of the, the lead actors in the play was a Chickasaw, uh, Indian from Oklahoma, whose last name was Harrison. And so there's this interesting dynamic of how uh, the portrayal of Native Americans in this play was brought about, even though there were indigenous people in the cast. Later, when a modern playhouse was built, this was quite an achievement for the town at that time, uh, finished in 1927, there was a playhouse association that put this together. Milton Kaufman, Walter Temple's business manager, was a director of that. Uh, Temple himself was a, a major cash donor. He and Henry E. Huntington provided the largest pledges of individual amounts, $15,000 each, uh, although Walter Temple's finances were starting to become a bit of a problem at the time that he was doing this. And that was simply because his income was declining dramatically. Those oil wells at Montebello that brought him up to $50,000 a month in the early days was gradually declining. It was a shallow field. And so the income began to drop significantly. By 1926, it was a matter of several thousand dollars a month rather than tens of thousands. And as much as he tried to replicate the success of Montebello in oil projects throughout greater Los Angeles, as well as outside of the area, it never was quite as successful. He had some oil wells that were producers, but not to the level 
that he had found earlier and that he needed because his real estate development projects also entailed obviously a huge amount of money, whether it was commercial skyscrapers in Los Angeles, meaning 11 story buildings for that time, or the significant investment at what became known as Temple City. So the chart basically was an X. You have the revenue dropping down and you have the uh, expenses rising dramatically uh, by the middle to late 1920s. And that meant that, uh, if, for example, Temple took out bonds to try to finance projects, whether it was uh, bonds for Temple City specifically, as well as those used for uh, development projects, uh, for example, in Alhambra. Taking out bonds means you get ready cash up front, but you have to take on a significant amount of debt over a long term for that. And by the time you got to the Great Depression of the 1930s, it was no longer feasible uh, and or practical to expect that they, Temple was going to be able to, to pay off that debt. And he began to sell off and, and lose properties to foreclosure, including the homestead here at our museum site, which was lost to a bank in 1932. By that time, Walter had moved to Ensenada in Baja, California to try to save money. His uh, children more or less split up into different areas. Agnes, the daughter, wound up marrying and moving to the Bay Area. The two younger boys stayed local, but one was more in Los Angeles in those years. The other, Walter Jr., settled in Puente, not too far from the homestead. Whereas Thomas, who had this real passion for history and genealogy, wound up moving in with an aunt, a sister of his mother's. Luz Gonzalez married a man named Jean Vigoré, who was French and Mexican. And the family, the Vigoré family, moved to, into an adobe that is now called the Ortega Vigoré adobe, just south of the mission off of Ramona Street. And that's where Thomas resided uh, after the family fortune was wiped out from, so from about 1930 uh, until he got married later in the decade. While he was a young man and, and Thomas was groomed to be first an engineer, probably to work for his father in oil projects, and then as an attorney, and Thomas got his degree at Harvard Law School, completed that in 1929, but never practiced a profession. Instead, as he often said, he was bitten by the genealogy bug and became known as the first person to systematically review the records of the California missions, to transcribe and translate them, and to do genealogies for people, as well as work on related historical uh, research projects of various types, including his documentation of the birth date of Los Angeles as September 4th, 1781. A lot of Thomas's work with genealogy has come into question over the years, uh, some of that because he connected dots where he probably made assumptions that we wouldn't do now, that genealogy has become more professionalized. He may have felt a sense of ownership as being a, a lone person uh, doing this as a known authority in genealogy. He deserves a lot of credit for uh, investigating as deeply as he did into these records. At the same time, we do find uh, that there have been mistakes that he's made and corrections have to be made as part of his genealogical work. He was the Mission and San Gabriel City historian for quite a long time. And uh, having dual roles meant that he presided over many different events. He's standing next to the uh, Father Serra statue that was put uh, in the, the mission area in 1921, as that earlier advertisement pointed out. Uh, but he would uh, have sponsor events and bring folks out to you know, commemorate Seta, uh, the Spanish migrations and colonizations. There was a massacre of colonists from Mexico near Yuma in, in, the, 19, in the 18th century that he uh, had commemorations for, wrote voluminously for San Gabriel Mission publications, and again was a city historian, quite well known locally. He be, uh, became engaged to Gabriela Quiros, who had a longstanding heritage in the San Gabriel and Alhambra area. When they were engaged in 1934, she was the queen of the fiesta for that year. And that year, they also started what was called the Pioneer Reception, held for almost four decades, where they invited descendants of, of families, not just from San Gabriel and the immediate area, but from throughout greater Los Angeles, to take part in a, a reminiscence, if you will, of early California, the gathering of descendants to remember their families. I mentioned the Yuma Massacre commemoration and other events that they were both involved in. And Thomas, even though he had a very severe case of throat cancer by the time the Mission Bicentennial was held in 1971, basically willed himself to stay alive to partake in that, that September. And he died within four months in January, 1972. Gabriela, by the way, was not only a local of note and, and the wife of, of the historian of the city, uh, 
and the mission, but she became the first female police officer in the San Gabriel department, uh, had a badge and, and all of that and worked her entire career there. And in fact, she was probably the principal breadwinner for she and her husband for uh, most of the time that she was employed there. So Gabriela's uh, on the left with her brother-in-law, Walter P. Temple Jr., who I mentioned earlier, uh, the daughter of Agnes Temple in the center, uh, the wife of uh, uh, Agnes, of the Ag Agnes Temple's uh, son. So she's a sister-in-law of the woman next to her. And then Josette Temple, Walter's daughter on the edge there. And so they're uh, celebrating at one of those pioneer receptions, uh, probably in the late 1960s. So the family, again, having involvement over about 130 years from the early 1840s to the early 1970s. Uh, Gabriela Quiros Temple died in uh, 2006, uh, buried at the San Gabriel Mission Cemetery, where many folks are. But Thomas, her late husband, was given at that time the unique distinction of being interred with the priest, you know, Campo Santo next to the stone church. There's not uh, now another layperson buried there, I understand. But for many years, uh, Thomas was the only uh, of, of that uh, distinction to be buried at the Campo Santo. We are going to return in the future. We'll have a date uh, fairly soon for the next in this series where we're exploring the Workmen and Temple families and their involvement in various locations throughout greater Los Angeles. We'll take this story to the Mission Vieja or Old Mission community I mentioned earlier. And uh, we'll go out to Los Angeles, Long Beach, Alhambra, uh, other locations throughout the, the region and talk about what these folks were up to in these locales. So look for those in the future. And I thank you for joining us today for this presentation, and we hope to see you again soon.